who would think it would be McMaster? It's not. It's, okay. Ni it's Niagara, uh, Order of Canada, Order of Nova Scotia. And now Sketches was uh, nominated for a traditional album of the year. And, you know, with all that being said, throw away me stats here. I don't know where that went. Um, but, like, that's a lot on a resume. And I did it in order. Of course, the seven kids is top priority. Uh, but, but when you look at all that and you look at, like, you know, yeah. coming from, uh, I think it's Troy, Nova Scotia. Yeah, that's right. Like, what do you think looking back? What do I think looking back? My goodness. It's so interesting. I, I don't know. There's there's a number of different ways my thoughts take me. I mean, I'll tell you the really cool thing that's similar to what you're talking about. <clears throat> One day, I suppose it was maybe like not this summer, but last summer. I remember sitting out on our porch. We have a porch swing and we live. Yeah, I won't tell you, but that's part of the thing. So I, I just went like this. I was sitting on the porch. Swing. It was a beautiful sunny day and I, I just went like this. And I really and truly pretended that someone put their hands on my eyes in 1991. It's 1991. I was thinking, it's 1991. It's like my first year of college or second year of college, whatever it was. And someone put their hands over my eyes and they say, Natalie, I'm going to show you a glimpse in your life like 28 years from now or whatever it is. Uh, something like that. And... Uh, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready for it. And then I took my hand away and I tried to see it as if I was a 20 year old girl from that perspective. And I was thrilled. I was like, oh my gosh, I have seven kids. Oh my gosh, I did marry that guy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I live on a farm. I have horses, <laughs> I have cows. Oh my gosh, I'm still playing the fiddle. I did all these things with my fiddle. My, my kids are playing fiddle. My husband plays fiddle. Look at all the music around us. Oh my gosh, I have chickens. I have a dog. I'm like, look at my house. Oh my gosh, look at my beautiful house. And so it's a similar thing as when you just rhymed off all those things. If you let yourself fall into that, yeah, you 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 need to do that every once in a while with with a fresh a fresh mind and and just say look where life has taken me. i do want to get into the music side of things but now as a person with a disability i i'm kind of fascinated because again you have seven children you mentioned that they all play fiddle and i hope it's not stepping out of bounds here when i say this but you do have a little one that i i believe it's does she have is it down syndrome down syndrome yes and like yes. i i i watched the christmas concert this year uh with my parents and i like how you included her because i know it sounds like when you say it, like, yeah, why wouldn't she include your child? Like, why wouldn't she? But there are times that people will be like, uh, no, like, let's let's just, it's not for you. We don't want you out on display. And I'm kind of like, mm. you don't see it. You don't hear about it because it's covered up. But I like how even, even if it's limited, you included her in that. And I like how she was grinning from ear to ear. So as a person with a disability, I was like, wow they're they're making her feel included she's gonna look back at this when she's older and be like all right maybe i'm not the best fiddle player i'm not the greatest at this but at least they made me feel welcome yeah 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 hey, Sadie, it's interesting you know we we do have a daughter with down syndrome and at the time when it was unexpected you know like you know i, I gave birth to her and a few minutes later the doctor said i think we your daughter has down syndrome and i was just the shock of shocks of shocks of shocks mind yeah. you any woman who's expecting a baby always wonders oh i hope my baby's healthy and safe and you know has you know all their fingers and toes and all that so that was a lot to deal with but oh my gosh so quickly danelle and i figured out oh my gosh there's no difference between her and the rest of them they all have their own personalities they all have their like she's exactly the same it's just yeah. that she's got down syndrome so we don't see her as different you know like so yeah it's not even a thought she just gets included because <laughs> she's she's just one of the team so yeah, when she, right. she goes and does her thing and that little cookie she is going to be able to play the fiddle she did of course on the show that you saw but she's just starting learning she's yeah. gonna be I know she's got it in her. She's got a yeah. ton of music. It, it, it's just, it's just like so. I guess kind of encouraging and enlightening to see because I mean, there's other, there, there could be other adults out there that's looking at that. Like, of course, they're looking at it from 
oh yeah, it's like Natalie McMaster. Like I, I grew up watching her. And then when they see one of the, like, you know, she comes out and tries her best playing it or just including her, they're like, yeah. even if it's a parent who don't know, who doesn't know your music or your career, but turned it on and then they're like, oh, look, look, she is a little fiddle player there herself. And then they might say, oh, well, if they have a child with Down syndrome or disability, they're like, wait a minute, if she's going to at least try it and she's going to be successful at it, yeah. why can't, you know, and it gets, I guess, a conversation going as well. That's right. That's right. No, it's good. It's good. It's a sharing for sure. I love it. I think it's easier for us too, just because we have so many kids, it's easier for her to be not seen as different or, or to be to be included because she's not even the youngest we have a two-year-old yeah. as well so she's just in there like yeah. you know yeah. if she was our only child we might look at it differently or something but it's boy when you when you go through it and all that you realize there's nothing to fear it, you just you just love them up oh what a what a darling yeah i can that's... actually talk about her all day and <laughs> no one ever asks me about her in an interview ever so oh, really you. yes and i just Oh, I like I said, I I'll stop talking about her, but she is one gem. No, no, I, I, I like it just because I feel like, you know, on my own front as a person with disability, like, you know, it sometimes gets overshadowed or it's not something you like, oh, no, like kind of I'm not going to say like in a mean way, like promote it or like, hey, I'm a person with disability, blah, blah, blah. But it is nice if someone ever comes stumbles across an interview and it could be like your favorite act, athlete, musician. And they just they just mentioned in passing like, hey, when I was five, uh, this happened, and I was born with right. this. You're like, didn't know. Good to know. Like, mm -hmm. I stumbled across. I think it was like Ed Sheeran had a stutter when he was smaller, and he listened to Eminem to kind of, which is the like almost a weird way to get rid of your stutter. Listen to a rapper that's gonna rap super fast. But I was like, all right, there's probably kids out there with a stutter that look at Ed Sheeran and go, totally. Okay, I wow. So. Yeah. You know, that's that's my kind of side of bringing it up because I was like, you know, yeah. years later from now, if she turns in to be a great fiddle player, you can come back and be like, actually, no one ever asked about you except for this interview. And that's now right. <laughs> we'll, have, like, we'll have the that's exclusive. Um, no, it is great. And it's so it's so great. Thank you. That's wonderful that, that you just bring her little sweet name. I put out this earlier on Twitter and uh, actually Heather Rankin was one of the first ones to like it. So I was like, oh, it's like. But I, I realized there's a little bit of a tie there too, is when your second album, I know at 16, I think you released your first one, but I, I believe it was your second album. Um, it was John Morris helped you with that one, correct? He was on the first one and the second. Yeah. Oh, on the second one as well, yeah. Yep. yeah. Can you kind of tell me, I guess, your relationship with him at the time and just your relationship with the Rankins? Because when you think Nova Scotia, there's a few acts that come to mind. And like, to me, that's one of the big ones is the Rankin family. Absolutely. Well, there would be no bigger fan of yeah. the Rankins than this puppy right here. <laughs> oh, and, and they, they had asked me, I'll tell you about Jim Morris in a minute, but they had asked me to do some shows with them. And I was like, cause Howie couldn't do it or something. And I was freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I had to learn the stuff and I'm learning by ear and I'm, Oh my gosh, I practiced and I practiced and I practiced and I was so awkward and I still had, didn't have my confident stage legs underneath me yet. I think I was probably just like 16 or, I don't know, maybe I was 18 or 19, but I wasn't very old. And uh, and I was it was absolutely thrilling. And I dare say with all the other accolades or adventures or everything that I've done since then, there might not be one so exciting as the day I got to play with them for the first time and the second time and the third time and the fourth time. Like it was just being at that age and revering them so much, they have no idea. But I will tell you about Jim Morris. Jim Morris helped me with uh, my uh, second CD, but he played on my first CD. So he kind of helped guide the ship a little better on the second CD or it wasn't a CD at all, it was a cassette. And on the first one, but Jim Morris, Jim Morris's name in Cape Breton is Golden, and he was a very humble, uh, unassuming master, mastermind, brilliant, um, and he didn't even know his brilliance. I'm sure he was just so natural, and we all loved him. And I still think of him, and I, yeah, I oftentimes will fondly remember Jim Morris and offer up a prayer or something because he meant a lot to many of us, especially me.
at nine, I believe you said you kind of grab the fiddle, but like, I guess it's different because when you see someone just say my age or 16 or whatever, like grab a guitar, it's kind of like the popular instrument at that time. It's something that people are like grabbed to like, oh yeah, I'll play a guitar or I'll play the piano. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and I could be wrong here, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, with the background of the fiddle, was that kind of like, ah, I'll play the fiddle because like, you know, I got family members that played the fiddle. Uh, or were you just gravitated towards the way it sounded? Like, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is people usually go towards a guitar or piano. What drove you more or less towards the fiddle? I got a, a three quarter size fiddle from a relative, my grand uncle, Charlie McMaster. So I was nine. So people often say, oh, you were nine. I would have thought you'd start. So it's like you get a fiddle in your hand. I'm like, well, no kids played those ages. like not when I was that age. So I asked my mom and dad about it now and she said, well, we, we never thought about putting a fiddle in your hands because we didn't know they made them that small. So dad had a fiddle in the house, like dad played a little bit. It was a full size fiddle. So at the age four and five and six, I can't even like, it's like, yeah. here. and so by the time this, this relative sent a fiddle to, to not, not just to me, it was, it was, it was sent for any one of the McMaster children, the big overall yeah. clan of McMasters. Anyone who wanted it could have it. And so I was the one that heard about it and show, said, I'd like to try it. And I started it that night and I have not put it down since. What kind of drove you, like when you started getting recognized, I guess, not just in your own uh, province, but across Canada, did you think like, Oh, this is this is amazing or it was almost like if it comes it comes if it don't i'm just gonna i have a passion for this regardless i have a passion for it regardless when i was um nine and playing age 10 11 12 13 into my teens i never thought that a person could could be a fiddler yeah that's Let alone like fiddler of the year <laughs> <laughs> like i just didn't think you knew that because everybody that i looked to and and looked up to were all they were all older and they all had jobs so they yeah. played the fiddle on the side i didn't know anybody who just did that so i didn't think you do that i didn't think that was an option but i knew i'd always i practiced every day i practiced hard every day i i knew there was just something about the challenge of knowing deep down that you can do something or pretty sure i can do that i just have to spend a lot of time at it to do it yeah. it kind of makes you there's something about that challenge that's what was a lot of the growth for me was knowing I could do it but just having to put the time into it it was the challenge of that so through the years I I kept it up and um and I, I have to say I'm having a bit of a mother moment I've lost what the question was what the dickens was I talking about Brian oh my god no, like I, I love everybody I, <laughs> no I was saying like because when I mentioned if you were doing it for like, because some people oh, play, yes. yeah, like play the instrument and then hope someday it leads somewhere and right. then others play for passion. Like it's, it's kind of an unfair, I guess, question away because you're going to play. It's not like you're going to just pick up an instrument and be like, oh, I hate doing this, but I hope someday that people recognize me for it. It's <laughs> totally. <right? laughs> but it's a great question. It's a great question. And certainly all through the years, I was motivated by, by the challenge of it, but as I got into, and, and I, for some reason, I, I said to my mom, she always reminds me, she said, you always said you'd do this for till the day you die. And I always just felt like that. I thought, well, I'll always play fiddle. And in the meantime, I went to teacher's college and okay. I thought, okay, I'll be a teacher. And I picked teaching because I love kids. And I thought it gives me summers, weekends, holidays free to go play fiddle. Yeah. And so I do have my teaching degree, but through my going to college, the music requests and everything, I was just traveling so much with music that I ended up having to finish my degree, you know, through correspondence. And I decided maybe in year three, I thought, I don't think I'm going to be a teacher. Like this is taking over. I was probably 20, 21. And so... And, that the, and then you heard more of people like the Rankin family who were becoming so big and yeah. people were doing this, East Coasters were doing this and even fiddlers were doing this and it just, it was that great magical time and I was lucky to be in on that time and it worked so well for me and, and I, I, and here it is, I'm 
48. I started playing when I was nine, so that's a long, that's a lot of decades to be fiddling, and that's all I've ever done. Now, like, never, it, it, never did, never did get my foot in a schoolroom. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you you taught your own kids how to play fiddle. I mean, that that in itself, you can say that's their teaching moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, we homeschool. That's kind of ironic. <laughs> Um, the, yeah, it all comes full circle either way. Now, now you get to see what kind of teacher you would have been, and then you realize, okay, maybe not, maybe not for me. <laughs> That's so true. When you have seven kids, and again, they all play instruments. When you're doing, uh, I, I can't remember how many years you've been doing this now, but the like Christmas concert specials. But like, how much prep work goes into that in all your performances, even with the children? Like, do they sometimes get tired and say, "Mom, like." not tonight and you're like no we that's not an option <laughs> it varies depending on the ages so when they were younger um which some of them are still younger like that yeah i didn't want it to be we might have something that we practiced and worked out and you'd be dying for them to do it but if they got cold feet or if they just weren't in the mood or something at a young enough age you just say that's fine because you don't want them to feel like they pushed. This. Yeah. Um, but then, and I would say those are ages like five, four, five, six, even seven is perhaps acceptable too. But at some point when they start to develop the reasoning and you want to develop morals in your kids, um, there have been a couple of times where, you know, they're nine, ten, and they're sometimes not feeling that well yeah. as a mother you know it's nothing serious or they're just for whatever reason they're just not in the mood or something and that's when they have a chance to learn about commitments and about um you know if you're going to commit to something you have to try your best to do it and i i always say to them you know if you're not feeling well for example if you feel a little little under the weather or whatever you don't have to do this. You yeah. don't have to do this. Mommy and this is mommy and daddy's show. But don't not do it because you're not in the mood. Yeah. Mommy's been on stage lots of times not feeling well. This is a chance for you to learn that like, you know, some people they go to work and they just have to go to work. They have important yeah. jobs and you know, and now people there's people here who, you know, at that at those ages they're they're kind of like we know that the crowd is expecting a little something from kids so we might say you know people are expecting that you might come out and yeah. it's okay if you don't but you don't want to disappoint them if you're just thinking you don't not in the mood like yeah. you have you know so every single time we have those conversations and they're they're nothing there's nothing too much fighting you know it's <laughs> very easy and every time they rise to the occasion and we make them feel like a million bucks yeah I feel like I, I feel like with those conversations, it's it's good. But like you know, when there's a lot of like tap dancing involved, just say if there's like you having an argument with your your son, and both of you have this thing on stage where both of you have to tap dance at the same time. I almost wonder, like, because sometimes when they're kids, they don't their 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 mindset is somewhere else, right? So I, I just kind of laugh at it. Like you, when you stamp out of a room and you're mad, you're like, you stamp out of a room and then you leave. I feel like sometimes it's like some people are like, geez, they're they're really tap dancing really hard up there. It's almost like he's trying to tell tell his mom something like, I don't like that you put me on stage, blah, blah, blah. And then you're just like, I did it because I wanted you to succeed. And he just comes back with like, I get it, but still I want to go home. <laughs> so, yeah, I know people wonder stuff like that too. Yeah. Of course they do. I would too. I still do. In fact, when I see families doing stuff together, I wonder like how into it are they or how much yeah. they feel like they have to do it or how much is coming from them. You know, no parent, generally speaking, wants to be someone who forces their kids into things. Um, that being said, I, I treat the music like vegetables. Like, vegetables are good for you, and you do have to learn to eat some. Okay, you don't have to finish your broccoli, but you have to eat it. You have yeah. to eat a little bit. You have to get used to those flavors. They're good for you. You know, and so... There's nothing wrong with saying to your, or you don't say to them, I guess, at young ages, but there's nothing wrong as a parent thinking, I know music is good for my child, and I know they can keep rhythm and they can keep pitch. So yeah. I'm going to enroll them in our homeschool music program, just like I would in school, 
if they're in school, you know, and teach them. And it's up to them whether they want to carry the torch. But there's call it call it music class, you know. It's it's uh, doesn't have to be anything that's forced, but it's like teaching them math or making them eat their vegetables. You know, they have to learn it. Uh, I know the value in it. I know the value far exceeds anything, any subject I ever learned in school. Like, there is no replacement for what music gives the soul. And it's eternal. And I have proof of that multiple times over my life. And I do want to give that gift to my kids. What they do with it in their older days, that's up to them. You know, like everything else in life. I want them to be happy and... So yeah, some of them may may really it may become a part of their who they are, and some of them it may be just something they do on the side. Who knows? I, I kind of want to do bring up one point there because when I'm looking at the background now in whole, like to me, has has the boys ever brought up to you? Like I know we were all fiddlers, but have they ever brought up and said this would be a great space to make a game center or to watch hockey games? Or have you just basically said no? <laughs> it's never come up. Really. That's not to say it won't, but yeah. no, it's never I, come up. I mean, I feel when like, we built, I feel like when you built, put down. <laughs> uh, when we built our house 10 years ago, this space, the kids used to call it the fly room because it was infested with flies because we never finished it. This oh. is the room of the garage. We didn't, we didn't need this room. We didn't know. We thought, well, we'll just, we were even going to make it like a fake room, you know, where you don't actually have real windows. And yeah. I remember saying, well, we better put real windows in. You never know. Maybe over the, maybe, maybe a mother in, in law or, or a parent or something, they, they might lose a spouse. They might need a room or like, I don't know. You're trying to think of things. So for a good six years, seven years, this was the fly room. It just collected flies. Kids wouldn't go near it. In fact, if I wanted to scare them, I'd say, if you don't stop that, I'm putting you in the fly room. And now, now like they so they my point is they've been here and are aware of when we converted it and we spent a long time trying to figure out what kind of flooring to put on because it, it's actually a sprung floor so that they can practice dancing oh, in wow. here so they were excited like oh my gosh we have a uh, space to dance and practice and then it was all about music this is music space and now we put studio equipment in here now and now we're recording in here it's become a studio yeah. And so, no, they're, they've they been excited with every little change and growth that this room has had over the years. I don't think it's even crossed their mind. Mind you, we have a massive basement, and the kids are playing hockey. The boys are playing hockey down there all the time, smashing the walls. So they know if there's going to be a game, it's going down there. Yeah, the last thing I kind of get, I guess, I want to ask you is, you know, because we kind of touched that at the beginning, but just to kind of wrap it up here. But, like, when you look back at all the stuff that you've accomplished, like the Order of Nova Scotia, Order of Canada, uh, like – what do you expect, I guess, when you're, and I, I it's, it's going to sound bad, but it's like, when, you know, when you're gone or when you're like, and your kids are left, yeah. like, what's, what's the legacy that you want people to remember? And it sounds like such a horrible question because it's like, you know, like, not at all. Like, like, not at all. Like, I think you're doing a great go, go, go job. <laughs> a great interview. It's a great question. Um, I think I just wanted them to know I tried in every aspect just want them to know I tried. I, I fail lots at things, but I want them to know I never stopped trying. I have a um, chalkboard on my in my kitchen, and I'm always trying to do things to inspire them to be kinder, to love more, to be charitable, to treat each other nicely, to keep the house tidy, to practice, all these things too. So I bought this little chalkboard and and this is just one of the main many things I'm constantly doing, but I, I put on it every day. I'll put on it an inspirational quote, usually from a saint or something like that, but sometimes I'll even say to the kids, you put your own quote on. And the thing is, it's the person who writes the quote remembers the quote the best. They don't know that. They think, oh, I'm so lucky I get used to chalk, but they'll remember the quote the best. So um, what did I put on yet? To, uh, actually, yesterday. Sometimes it stays on a couple of, for a couple of days. It was like... Um, it was basically only use it, others should be treated with kindness and and I guess I can't remember the exact words but the second half of the quote is only use anger if it's an absolute necessity only use harsh words if it's an absolute necessity 
And so, um, so in here the other day, all oh, there was a little kerfuffle. Somebody was, was uh, one of the older kids was helping one of the younger kids with their math, and the younger child got really angry because you know they want to do it their way, right? Yeah. And they kind of this little miniature explosion happened between the personalities, and somebody stomped off, and so I said, "Uh huh, wait now, wait now. Was that a necessity? You just got." really angry here like was that in the was it necessary like did you ask them once nicely first if they would just you know stop or let you do something no i didn't so so hopefully those little by living you know together and having to live and work out learning how to work together hopefully that little quote with that little episode maybe they'll remember that okay only get angry when absolutely necessary what's necessary mom and i said well there's a little kid you know, running down the laneway and the cars are on the on the highway and they keep running down there and you've told them a number of times nicely, don't run down the laneway. Well, if they keep doing it, you might have them have to give them a good licking. Like, yeah. hey, you get angry at them. You say, don't go down there, you know, and because you're, you're, you're saving their life, really, or you know what's good for them. So I said, those are necessities. So, you know, anyway, we'll see if it works. So hopefully when I'm gone, They'll remember all some of those quotes and the way mommy tried to enforce them. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Natalie McMaster for coming on to the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob Sang. Thank you for listening, and good night.